Here we go, season four, episode 21. Starting off with the Grisha fight with the Royal Line. He attacked, but he also sit on you. <laughs> you didn't need that. I'll just take this. Yoink. <laughs> yeah, and we, we find out that, oh my God. And this is all Eren's fault, we found out, for strongly suggesting that Grisha do this. Grisha's all like, I can't kill children, but Eren's like, you really should though. And Grisha's like, all right, when you put it that way. But he had no choice, you see, no choice. One thing we've learned is that no one really has any choice because if people suggest things, or if you have memories, what else can you do? You gotta do it. Similarly, if a country threatens you, you gotta fight that country, right? And if there's children in the way, or there are civilians at a theater, what else could I have done? What else can you do? You gotta kill them all, right? You gotta listen to this interdimensional memory rage spirit. Eren, the angry ghost of Christmas future. The whole Eren future memory thing is not proving what people wanted to prove, that Eren had no choice. I think to me it's just proving that the choice happened at a different time. It's still Eren making a, a cho choice, no? Like, it's tough because it's a time loop, in a sense, and I'm not good with these, but it seems to me that either time is sort of an illusion and that there are no events even because time is just a solid mass that's been preset. And so there is no even humanity in the way we conceptualize it. In which case there's no morality to anything anyway, because there's no choice involved. Or the cycle started at some point, in which case there, there was a choice being made at some point even if now it's sort of set. I don't really see any way that it could be in between, but I'm getting way ahead of myself when we watch the episode. Right, there's still things being obfuscated from him. Is it a form of mercy from Eren giving him just the amount he needs to give him to get him to do his plans, but not to cause him pain? I don't know. And then the weirdest reunion that ends up being insanely touching. Yeah, I feel like that's been clear for some time even despite all the Uno reverses. Yeah, people have been hinting at this for a while. The show's been hinting at this for a while. Flashback to the beast in the season four part one opening, the demon. But daddy loves you. And Eren also loves you for giving you this in a weird way, but also in a masterful and condescending way too, where he's just so above it. He just is like, here Zeke, let me close your arc for you so you can, you know, be irrelevant again. Watch the anger and all of his scheming sort of just drain from Zeke's eyes. That's all he really wanted, right? Daddy's love. <laughs> well, this is awkward with Aaron being right there and all. And back to the timeless desert. And Aaron just standing in that pose, you know, to look dramatic and look cool. Right. When he touched the story of his hand, right? There it is. But it's all for nothing, we already know. It's not going to come to be. Wouldn't count on Eren. There's anyone who can scream his way through obstacles. Yeah. There's so many questions raised. One thing I'm still wondering about is what exactly is Ymir? What's Ymir's origin? There's just so much to try to unravel, I feel like. There's just no way I'm gonna wrap my head around all of it on first viewing. But if I'm getting this right, it's interesting that Eren simultaneously saw the future but didn't know the whole thing. Like, pieces of it get revealed to him as he goes. Like, for example, he saw the memories, the actual memories of what happened with Grisha, you know, him being there and influencing it, but didn't know exactly how that would happen until Zeke took him into this weird Ymir desert. That is interesting because it creates a situation where he has to have faith in the fact that things are going to happen the way he's seeing them happen. And also suggests that at least as far as we've gone, things are pretty set. Like if they're seen, then they're gonna happen. I guess my question then, which I think would be really significant for the results of the story and where it's going, is where does that set in stone series of events begin and end? To take it to an extreme, it could be that all of existence has already sort of been established and then it's just repeating like it's obviously a cycle the name in the first episode is to you in 2000 years right but what i think is maybe more likely or maybe it's just that i'm hoping for this because i think it would be more interesting is that there's this loop happening that is largely covered by the events of the show but the time and existence and events extend both before and after that loop so the future after the loop is not set so for example there could be a point where Aaron or another person with these powers or whatever goes back in time to start 
start the cycle, but then dies, or somehow this power is eliminated, or something like that, so that time continues on normally, and there can be a resolution that isn't just an infinite loop of tragedy that's in the show. From you, 2,000 years ago, again, birds. These are, these are cute birds, though. Historia birds are better than Aaron birds. It feels so good to see her, it's been so long, even if this is just a flashback. Historia had such a, like, a crazy character run, and then she just sort of, like, settled into obscurity at some point. But I feel like that might change. Oh, this is actual history. I'm a little bit confused by who this is. This is the story of the person who the Fritz girl was pointing out to Historia in the book that perhaps Historia based some of her personality on. Yeah, it seems like they were already struggling in that village with their, their dead eyes. And this is your reward, being conquered. She's gonna come forward, not even come forward, she's gonna get blamed. Singling out the little child though, very pathetic. Wait, what? How did she end up with an arrow on her back? And that is how she ended up with an arrow on her back. This is going to be a lot more significant than I thought it was going to be at first. Speaking of origins... Wow, that's beautiful. It's like the tree of life, but a snake. Right. Is this the first titan? Is this Ymir? Wow, what an honor. <laughs> Did she give birth to each of the distinct titan forms? Oh, some descent. She died saving the original King Fritz. Ah, uh, so they weren't born that way. She was split. The three walls. It's funny, because I was just saying how I would like some backstory on Ymir. A lot of it fits right into place. Like, the things we're seeing in the show were there from the beginning. There are the two sides in this conflict that, at least for our purposes and what we see, could just have been any two sides. There's no suggestion that one is more morally righteous than the other. It's just two warring kingdoms. One of whom who happens to reign over this girl finding this power, which is still that extra missing link from the real into the supernatural. What was that thing? I mean, it was amazing looking. The tree of life snake thing in the water. She found something primordial and divine in her sadness. And it seems to suggest that her power and her connection to this thing was born from that kind of sadness, at least in a major way, which perhaps explains a lot of the hellishness that it created. Even if she did a lot of good with it for her people, you know, like building infrastructure and things like that, there's still that thread to the past, even if it's just a thematic thread where it was all born from suffering and so it can never really escape from suffering. And speaking of cycle and legacy. We know that all the people who hold titan forms are in some sense a reflection of their originators. Does this not in a sense connect to Eren's view of freedom? Like Ymir, despite her power, was still a slave to the end, right? I mean, she even died for her captor. Am I, am I getting that right? Even after being freed, she wasn't free, which saying that out loud is a very Eren thing. If we're talking about choice and free will, one thing that is not a choice is the things we're born with, which might even include, I think does include, a certain propensity for things, you know, perhaps a certain baseline disposition, or a certain baseline probability of forming certain dispositions with the right inputs, if that, if that makes sense more accurately. And if that is the connection they're building, then Aaron was kind of set up to have this leaning, this drift towards obsessively fighting for his freedom. So perhaps to a certain extent at least, having sympathy for Ymir would mean having sympathy for Eren as well. And maybe it's not a cycle where Eren goes back and researches the events of the show. Maybe the to you in 2000 years is from Ymir to Eren, which is in a sense also Ymir. It is really cool to think about from this depiction how much it makes sense that there's such a polarized but religious-like reading of her in history. How to one side she's this devil figure, a blight on the earth, yet to one side she's this divine provider, this angel-like god figure. It's worship that's formed from the incredible smallness and powerlessness other people have in her wake. It's also a very literal and extremely morbid take on the whole eat my flesh and be granted eternal life religious thing. 
Is she still doing housework in the desert? What is she sculpting? Oh, she's building the rumbling. We deserve to be free. <laughs> right, it all starts with the mirror. To you in a thousand years. She woke up. Here it is. And back to this this moment. Eren is getting this power. He just got whatever that was directly. What is it gonna look like? I'm so excited and terrified at the same time. Oh my god, the walls are coming down. Has it already begun? Yeah, it's time to stop this fighting. Something way bigger is happening now. Did Fush Flash get, just get smushed? The walls are not gonna be happy. Or maybe they'll be very happy. This is all happening so, so quickly. Like, he barely even has a body yet. Oh, it's so unbelievable seeing the walls come down after all this time. The walls that once served as the only thing keeping it, keeping humanity alive. He goes for Gabby. Ah! <laughs> what the hell? What in the world? I need to read that again. I need, I need a moment. The founder of Ymir gained the power of the Titans through contact with something deep in a lake under a tree. Is it a pathogen that parasitizes humans? Or is it a god that took pity on the founder's plight? We may never know, right? I feel like it would be great to find out and have it all be connected, but I feel like even if it, it doesn't, it's sort of all right. But it probably will at least have some kind of symbolic significance. And I feel like that'll become more clear as the show comes to an end, but I can take a very simple guess now maybe and say that it could be an animal or a living being in a form that represents the facet of life that has been brought up many times in the show about sort of the cruelty of nature, that primordial sort of terror. This might sound really bizarre and crazy, but this is something I can deeply connect to. You know, it's not hard for me to feel this disgusting element of life, you know, this pathogenic, cruel, rotten underbelly of all life. That is an archetype that exists, at least conceptually. It's decay and powerlessness and unfairness and Rob Race's Titan form and animalistic terror. You know, I have a Attack on Titan-like animal metaphor. You know, characters are always looking at butterflies and crap. A while back, I went crab fishing with some friends and we really had no experience doing it, but we ended up being very successful and every crab we caught, we threw in a bucket. I didn't know this about crabs at the time, but they do not like that. <laughs> and so I was watching them sort of pile up on each other and a little crab got just too close to a crab that was about twice the size. And the big crab took his claw, wrapped it around the smaller crab's entire body and essentially just split it in half, which didn't kill the smaller crab. It was just sitting there, cut in half, spouting bubbles and watching at it, imagining what it was like for that crab to experience that and just the absolute tragedy and pain of its existence. And that is just one instance of a world where that is happening every moment in just practically infinite ways. So that feeling is definitely there to be tapped into. And this idea is too big for me, but I just have the sense that if you follow that all the way down the path or all the way up maybe to the most objective, it's just another part of that natural struggle between growth and atrophy. You know, the fact that the universe is always decaying, you know, things are not permanent yet there's a desire to grow, you know, things change, things become more complex, things evolve even, you know, which to me suggests that on some weird level, the laws of existence collaborate to create something like a will to survive. It's this endless struggle and making it even more complex is the fact that the things that help you survive today might end up sowing the seeds of your destruction later. And so to be aligned with the thing that is most conducive to that kind of growth has to work not only now, but when rippled out to all of the rest of existence, if that makes sense. And I think it's in that very distinction that a lot of human good and evil is found. We have this fight, you know, we have this strong desire to survive. The question is, how can you bring those actions into alignment, not only with your own survival, but to the survival of this essence of life, you know, this essence of living and existence, as opposed to this essence of destruction and decay. And so I think this parasite snake tree of life thing or whatever could be that very thing that exists in humans already. That would make a lot of sense to me as being the origin for a lot of the initial themes in the show that have been counteracted by other people in the show later, while also leaving room for there to be a little bit more in the final verdict. He looks like the thing too. His bones resemble it. God, imagine... 
Oh my god. This is what it looks like. It's bigger than a colossal. That is Aaron, sort of. Yeah. This is the boss titan. This is us winning. And I'm sure that's all he'll destroy. Armin doesn't believe it. Look at his face. This is one of those things where I have to be right because I'm, if I'm not right, I can't face the consequences of what that means. Elena's not having a great time anymore. <laughs> what? What gave it away? Yeah. He can make a broadcast? He can just broadcast to them. Right, right, right. They're all here. Pixis is here. So even people who are titans can hear this. Very flattering image of Eren. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Eren's plan has been revealed, and I think that the means of getting there were complex and were masterful, but the end goal is something that I, I think was intuitable just from his demeanor and actions and raw rage that he turned outside to the world and the fact that he's clearly established his idea that evil must just be destroyed and that basically anything is expendable towards that goal, you know, including civilians and children, etc. I mean, what does it matter, the children or theater goers you have to kill at Willie Tiber's most boring play of all time, if this is your end goal? That devastation, while extremely significant to those that were affected by it, is nothing to someone who's planning to destroy the world. So that's sort of been there. And that's become something of a big thing for me. You know, you could sort of guess at what people would do if they could make any choice without fear of reprisal, judging by the tiny actions they make at a local level where they don't fear repercussions. You know, I said something similar about Zeke where if he sees himself as being capable of making the choice to end the bloodline through a form of genocide of an entire people, you would expect that person to also not really have any qualms about betraying comrades and also not really have any qualms about turning a couple children into titans. Same goes for Eren if he's willing to see other people as disgusting if they don't agree with his vision, if he's that quick to categorize, and if he feels like anyone who challenges his vision or pose a threat to him and his freedom or the survival of his friends deserve to be obliterated, then what is actually going to stop him when he has all the power in the world. And in real life, speaking of sides, this is part of why I don't like to take them, because you'll find that a lot of people with the holiest and righteous of goals are very quick to mistreat others. And so to me, it's sort of like your stated goal is not your goal. There's something else going on, probably something more selfish driving your actions than actual goodness, because if your goal is goodness, then goodness is available to you right now at a very local level. I'm very wary of people like many characters in the show who would save the world, but have seemingly no issue with cruelty towards the people they interact with or go to these sorts of extremes where it's like people who disagree with me deserve everything bad that's coming to them and more you know what i'm saying there's a lack of humanity there that sort of disqualifies one i would say from being in any sort of leadership position yet that element persists in everything in every side in every cause in every organized group of people there are those who actually are good and decent and also believe in the cause and people who are there for perhaps more sinister or self-serving reasons and so Aaron now has this titan form which in such a beautiful way physically represents the thing that your mirror found it it is something it is something else that has been brought to life if there's something right about my theory that it represents this form of nature you know this sort of primordial fight to survive and all the terror and destruction and fear that can create how perfect is it that a big theme in the show has been brought to physical life at the finale and looks amazingly terrifying it's like the very worst element of the show's ideology itself is the final boss i also just love in this episode the circle finally connecting it, it feels like something beautiful clicking where wow this is a moment of freedom that satisfies 2,000 years or more of slavery from Ymir. In a very interesting and compelling way, it makes them one character sort of in connection to a common idea, you know, this freedom from this sort of hell, you know, but doing so through a fight for survival in, in a very raw and animalistic way. Arian, I think, just solidly became a villain in the world, but simultaneously a, a hero for someone lost and in pain, which is, in a sense, himself. <laughs>
There's a lot there. You know, episodes are coming out weekly, but I feel like for every episode I need a year to decompress, which is amazing. This final, final, maybe, season keeps delivering in a way that despite my insanely high expectations, I never could have hoped for. But now going forward, I think at long last, there have been some clearer, let's say, lines drawn in the sand where it's basically choice time. There's no waffling between the various sides. It really is like Aaron or not Aaron feels to me at this point. And also just practically speaking, what kind of crazy battle is this going to be where you have this scattered team of unbelievable veterans like Peak and Reiner on one side, but also Mikasa and Jean John and Armin and that whole regiment, and potentially Levi, who hopefully is drying himself off and is on his way by now. You know, these really, really amazing, talented people with tons of experience battling this insane army and the Founding Titan. It's going to be sick.